Tonight's presentation will be given by John Fabiano, Executive Director of the Monmouth County Historical Commission. He's been researching the legend of Molly Pitcher for a long time now, and his professional training has him looking at it from a different angle and considering all the possibilities, which is something that every good researcher needs to be open to. So without further ado, please welcome John Fabiano. Good evening, everyone. I'm happy to be here. I'm a um, proud member of the organization, and um, I have a very interesting program tonight. I want to get started, um, so we're not here too late this evening. So I'll share the screen now. Hopefully that'll work. Here we go. Okay, what I have here is um, actually an item in my possession. It's from the Union Metallic Cartridge Company. Um, it's a calendar. It's a cutout of Molly Pitcher, and it's the Molly Pitcher image that most of us have, will recognize. Um, it's the woman at the cannon uh, firing away at the Battle of Monmouth, and um, she becomes noted for this activity, and from then on is known as Captain Molly or Molly Pitcher. The earliest known account um, of Molly Pitcher is from 1830 and it's Freeman Hunt's collection of American anecdotes. It's his second volume. And interestingly enough, if you could read at the first sentence there, it says before the two armies, American and English had begun the general action of Monmouth, two of the advanced Batteries commenced a very severe fire against each other. As the warmth was excessive, the wife of a cannoneer constantly ran to bring water from a neighboring spring. At the moment when she started from the spring to pass to the post of her husband, she saw him fall and hastened to assist him, but he was dead. At the same moment, she heard an officer order the cannon to be removed from its place, complaining he could not fill his post by as brave a man as had been killed. No, said the intrepid Molly, fixing her eyes upon the officer. The cannon shall not be removed for the want of someone to serve it. Since my brave husband is no more, I will use my utmost exertions to avenge his death. The activity and courage with which she performed the office of cannoneer during the action attracted the attention of all who witnessed it. Finally, of General Washington himself, who afterwards gave her the rank of lieutenant and granted her half pay during life. She wore an epaulet and ever buddy called her Captain Molly. That's the traditional image that we have of Molly. But there's another image in the collection of the Historical Association. And that's Dennis Malone Carter's Molly picture being presented to George Washington. Now, Here's a woman that doesn't appear to have been in a battle. Um, general Green is presenting her to the general and Baron von Steuben. And she's well-dressed and she's receiving the accolades of the entire army after a fierce battle. Something's not right here. It's disjointed. It's a constant dissident or something similar. Well, Back here in Allentown, we've always had tradition that Molly Pitcher was from here. And our, we base that on the fact that Reverend Swain in his historical discourse done in the centennial year of 1876 wrote, moreover from among us it is said was the famous Molly Pitcher. She who at the Battle of Monmouth acted the role and its italicized role of cannoneer in the place of her husband or some other brave who had fallen beside his gun. She was reputed to have been the daughter of one John Hanna of Allentown, was of North Ireland extraction, and had been for a time a servant in the family of the father of Captain James Brewer. Okay, it's the same story essentially. We get a little bit of a twist now. We have her identity. It's, she's the daughter of John Hanna. Okay. 
who is that person? But first, I have to tell you that the source of this is footnoted in the discourse, and her name is Sarah Smith Stafford. There she is. I'm very fortunate to have an image of her. It, she is the only daughter of James Baird Stafford, called to the Allentown Academy to become its first tutor. It was said about her, from her childhood, Miss Stafford was to say, clad in a petticoat of red, white, and blue, she wore her patriotism with pride and sincerity and was the custodian of many valuable relics of the revolution as well as the only person of her, of her sex who had been honored with a membership in the New Jersey Historical Society. Her father, James Baird Stafford, was an individual of note. At the outbreak of the Revolutionary War, he was in mercantile business in New York. It was said he refused the King's oath and went to Boston and fitted out the privateer Kitty. Now, Stafford grew up with Commodore John Barry in Wexford, Ireland. That's important because Barry himself rec recommends Stafford for his conspicuous duty of taking a letter to Henry Lawrence, who was then the head of the Congress who had been captured and was then prisoner in the Tower of London, taking a letter to him. Essentially, I would say, don't negotiate or don't give the oath. We'll get you out of there. And here is a transcription of that letter. At the request of the Secret Committee of Congress, this is Ben Franklin and um, Robert Morris and the others, I sent him with a message from then to Henry Lawrence Esquire, the prisoner in the, then a prisoner in the Tower of London. This duty he performed with great fidelity and success. Now, here is John Hanna's tax record from 1780. It's at the very bottom. It shows that he has seven acres value of land was 15 pounds, house and lot, he had two cattle, and his tax was levied at 25 pounds, 15 shillings, and two pence. The man was fairly well off, fairly well off for this time. Here's his will, and in his will, there's reference to a daughter, Mary, Mary Cavanaugh. And fifthly, I bequeath unto my daughter, Mary Cavanaugh, one feather bed with new striped tick, a bolster, hand-turned bedstead and cord, also a new silk handkerchief, and one heifer for her granddaughter, Nancy Cavanaugh. This is where they lived, the east wing where the right side, or the left side, I'm sorry, was 1800, and the earlier part was 1760. It's today on the State and National Register of Historic Places in Allentown and is known as the S. Potter House. It is 19 High Street. Now, this is what encouraged me to look further into this tradition of Molly Pitcher being from Allentown. This is a page from the New Jersey State Museum's exhibition catalog from the Centennial. It was entitled The Pulse of the People. It's a wonderful catalog. In fact, three of the image or two of the images tonight will be from this catalog. On the same page was the image that was on the cover of Molly Pitcher. It's a painting that's unattributed in the possession of the old Barracks Museum in Trenton. But down below is Captain James Buer's sword, which was in the possession of the Monmouth County Historical Association. Regrettably, it has been lost. 
So as an aside, if anyone has ever seen this, please make the folks aware at the association. Hunting sword was circa 1750. It was a silver mounted hunting sword with black leather scabbard, grips of ivory, stained green with a lion's head pommel, 30 and three quarters inches. James Bruer was a captain of the Allentown militia. His father's name was Peter Bruer and he married Eleanor Price. She was the daughter of David Price, Monmouth County, whose sister was Susanna, wife of Wilson Hunt and mother of John Price Hunt. I'll get to why that's important soon. Here's the current mill property or the mill building, 1855, but the earlier mill was built approximately 1715 by Nathan Allen. It was prior to the Revolutionary War in the possession of the, those in charge of the rebellion. There was a transfer of a deed, which is in Borough Hall off office, that shows John Ray, deceased, transferred the property to his brother in August of 1774. And right after that, um, the agents that were in charge of that transfer were the Philadelphia Committee for the Release of the Bostonians um, that were acting on behalf of a petition from Paul Revere. Uh, they milled the grain in the original mill here to relieve the refugees during the blockade in Boston Harbor as early as 1774. And this mill remained in military hands and was used as a supply depot and a place where they would interrogate prisoners throughout the war. Now, this is from the Hessian State Archives, Marburg, Germany. It's a wonderful map that I found on the West Jersey history um, site. It shows the defenses in Allentown. June 24th, 1778, before the Battle of Monmouth. It's the British defenses. It's incredible imagery uh, for someone who's grown up here and has been studying the Revolutionary War as long as I have. Um, it shows the mill, the mill pond. And if this information was available to Washington at this time, it would have been extremely valuable. Washington is holding a council of war in Hopewell. I'm sure you recognize this bronze relief by James Edward Kelly of the council of war at Hopewell from the battle monument across the street from your headquarters. It appears to be Washington or um, Lafayette pleading to Washington to attack, attack the British on their march across New Jersey. Here's the house where the Council of War was held. It was known as the Joseph Stout House, although at the time it was occupied by a John Price Hunt. Do you remember I had mentioned that there was a family relation between the Brewer family and the Price and subsequently the Hunt family. John Price Hunt hosted Washington at this Council of War. Here's a receipt that shows that he was paid 10 pounds, two shillings and six pence. It's signed by, well, it's a receipt we know is Richard Harrison's receipt because here's his expense account. I'm gonna, I'll come back to this because it plays a part later in the program. But essentially it shows that 
Washington's itinerary from Hopewell, where he stayed with John Hunt, through Kingston with Thomas Wetherill, and to Dr. Stites' house in Cranberry. And just below there, you can barely see it. I'll show you a close up. To a servant at Mrs. Watkins by the general's orders, it's $1. Again, this is Robert Harrison's expense account for the campaign. Now, it's a bit problematic, like most historical documents are, because it gives no date for when the payment was made to the servant and Mrs. Watkins. But it does show a subsequent expense down below that's dated July 19, it appears, or 17. So the payment was made somewhere in between there. By making a genealogical, genealogical family connection between the Brewer family and the Hunt family, it gave me confidence that there might be more to this expense account than meets the eye. Here is Mrs. Watkins. Excuse me. This is Lydia Stilwell, who was born in the Hallen house along with the six beautiful sisters. The rest of this program is gonna be pretty much focused on these six women. And in particular, one of their nieces by the name of Theodosia, who would eventually marry Aaron Burr. So stick with me, the program gets much more interesting. Lydia Stillwell was born in 1726. She was the wife of John Watkins Watkins and youngest of the six beautiful sisters of Richard Stillwell and Mercy Sands, who lived in the Allen House. Watkins was a West Indian merchant, um, mostly out of St. Christopher, and he resided at Harlem near Colonel Rogers Morris's house which would be Washington's headquarters eventually. John Watkins was constrained to live abroad during the Revolutionary War, which caused Lydia to vacate Watkins Glen. Yes, Watkins Glen, their son uh, was the namesake for Watkins Glen, New York. That was the name of their mansion. It became a popular resort of the British officers who were quartered in the neighborhood, who kept it in working order during the war so that she had a roof over her head when priests returned. Here's an image of her mother, second wife of Richard Stilwell. His first wife was Deborah Bound. They had eight children, two sons, and the six sisters, which included twins, Mary and Anne. The Allen House, which we've seen earlier. Um, wonderful sight, and I'm very happy to hear that it's being restored. Here's the next youngest sister. Her name was Elizabeth, or next oldest, I'm sorry. She was three years older. She married first Captain Peter Raxel, who died in the French and Indian War, and subsequently his friend, Lieutenant Colonel John Monsell. It was said of Elizabeth, that she was a very beautiful woman, possessed of great force of character, but whom every womanly element predominated. Now, most of what I've learned about these sisters was from John E. Stilwell's wonderful genealogy of the family. I believe it was four volume genealogy. In fact, the books are oversized, and because they were oversized, it allowed these wonderful um, images. Uh, to be shown, mostly of portraits of the sisters. And I believe the painter of the majority was a 
gentleman by the name of John Wallace. This is Pinehurst. It's where the Watkins lived in Harlem. Actually, it was just north of City College. It was the site of the Battle of Harlem Plains. The general had consciously decided to forego the conflict, quote, between loyalty to this king and affection for his wife, her kindred and many friends, his position was trying. Accepting half pay commanding in Ireland, he and his wife departed in 1775, not to return until 1784. As a British subject, he was not allowed to hold property. Therefore, he petitioned the New York legislature in 1790 and received permission to hold property up to the value of 10,000 pounds. Pinehurst, near General Morris's, um, today it's known as the Morris Jumel Museum, and it's a wonderful historic site in Harlem Heights. Here's an image or a map showing the Mars house up on the heights and it appears to be Day's Tavern along the road where most likely the Moncel properties were located. Now here's the most interesting of the sisters. The eldest of the firstborn twins was Mary, who married in 1745 Captain Thomas Clark, a gentleman considerably older, who died leaving a large estate. He bought a fine piece of property between 23rd and 28th Streets. He named Chelsea after the famed London veterans, old veterans home. After the original house burned down, Mistress Molly, as she was called, being a capable and energetic woman, set to work to rebuild the house. Mrs. Clark's loyalty to the American cause was much questioned, and her policy was doubtless one of prudence than of affection for the struggling country. Her children, however, were impetuously, of, or were with the impetuosity of youth, excuse me, were more outspoken and were dubbed the Tory brood. In fact, her son, Clement C. Clark was listed as a loyalist in Sabine's account of loyalists. Here's a Wollaston portrait of Captain Thomas Clark, the founder of Chelsea, section of Lower Manhattan. Now, here's the house that she built after the first burnt down. You notice it says the residence of the late Bishop Moore. That's because one of her daughters would marry the Bishop of Trinity Church. And their son, just an aside, was Clement Seymour, who penned towards the night before Christmas. Now, back to Molly, or Mary. You can see on the map here, at the very top, it shows the location of their property, very extensive property. I believe this was the, um, the end of an Indian path. The Pekin, um, I believe was the old name uh, that came off from uh, Bowery Lane here and uh, at an intersection with the King's Bridge, which would head up north. <clears throat> now down below, it's probably difficult to see, but it's Abraham Mortier's house. And during the conflict, Molly, being advised to stick by the property, had a number of American soldiers billeted upon them, which caused much distress. So one of the officers represented the matter to General Washington, who personally rode to the house and gave orders by which the family were relieved from the American troops. Now, this map will show Washington's trip from the Mortier house up Monument Lane here, the old monument to uh, James uh, Wolfe that was there in the early times that's no longer there and up to the Chelsea section. Perhaps this was about April 27, 1776, 
when I found that the general orders for the day were given, quote, that the riotous behavior has filled the general with much regret. The order that should like behavior be practiced again, the authors will be brought to the severest punishment, treated as a common enemy. Mrs. Clark's house, after the Americans evacuated Manhattan and their loss at Fort Washington, was subsequently builded by Hessians till the British eventually evacuated in 1783. Now, here's her twin sister. And excuse me, but she has the most gorgeous gown and the image is wonderful. I was glad to find a color image on the internet very recently, but it showed me that the detail on the silk dress is incredible. Uh, Bernadette, I know you'll enjoy this. Um, the embroidery, if you notice, is pointed to one side of her. And I'll go back to her twin. Here's Mary, very similar embroidery, most likely the same seamstress, but she pointed hers to the opposite side. Being a male, I guess I thought I would find that interesting. Back to Anne, Mary's twin. In 1742, she married Theodosius Bartow, who's Missionary father was sent to Westchester County and was a leader in Shrewsbury's Christ Church. Oh, I'm sorry, it was Theodosius was, not the father. While Anne was pregnant with her daughter in 1746, her husband suffered a fatal carriage accident, and Theodosia was named after her deceased father. Anne would subsequently marry Captain Philip de Visme in 1751. According to Johnny e. Stilwell, she possessed good business capacity and evidently managed the large estate or a mercantile venture. Her and Devisme lived at the National Historic Landmark, known as the Hermitage in Ohokus, Bergen County. Near here, Mrs. Watkins, then a refugee from Manhattan, British occupied New York, also was scheduled to host Washington after the Battle of Monmouth on his way to New Windsor. Now, I know that's a mouthful, but I'm gonna show you the headstone of Theodosius Bartow in the Christ Church. It was said that he's not necessarily buried here, but the stone, his stone was used along with others for a path in the cemetery and uh, then was subsequently placed here. Here's Captain Philip de Visme, who died, who would die in 1762. So she's a widow again, as early as 1762, living with her daughter, Theodosia, at the Hermitage. Here's the hermitage. I'll get back to this later. Here is the image of Theodosia from the ex exhibition catalog I had earlier shown. It's cloth, it's sequins, it's silk, it's, it's needlework. Uh, my wife happens to be uh, an expert in needlework crafts, and it's just amazing. I haven't found any other portrait of her. Any other attributed portrait is most likely one of her aunts. Now, most interesting, she had a, what's said as a cosmopolitan education. She would marry at 17 years of age, Colonel Jacques Marcus Prevost of the New Royal Regiment. He was from Geneva. He was 10 years her senior. She and Jacques had five children. With her husband serving in Georgia and the Caribbean, she moved in with her mother 
Here they lived in modest elegance. The ladies were accomplished and intelligent, and for a long time the residence was the center of the most polished society in the vicinity. They remained here during the Revolutionary War and entertained officers of both British and American armies alike. It was said of Theodosia, although she was not beautiful, disfigured by a forehead scar, she possessed mental endowments of so high an order. She was indeed in all respects a most estimable lady, affectionate, accomplished, and well-versed in literature and was given to the practice as, ad as adverse to the profession of piety. I had to think about that one for a while, but was given to the practice as adverse to the profession of piety. Now, being the wife of a British officer, surprisingly, she writes to General Washington, who, as I said earlier, was scheduled to go with his senior staff for some R&R &R on his way to New Windsor and stay at Mrs. Watkins, who was the neighbor of Mrs. Provost at that time. So what we have here is an original document, Garden State Legacy um, website had this online. It's in the possession, I believe, of the Hermitage. It shows that Mrs. Provost writes to Washington and asks that he stay at her place instead. Mrs. Provost presents her best respects to His Excellency General Washington, requests the honor of his company as she flatters herself the accommodations will be more commodious than those to be procured in the neighborhood. Mrs. Provost will be particularly happy to make her house agreeable to His Excellency and family. This is Friday morning, most likely July 3rd, 1778. This is from James McHenry's Life and Correspondence. And excuse me for reading, but from hence we passed through a fertile country to a place called Paramus. We stopped at a Mrs. Watkins whose house was marked for headquarters. But the general receiving a note of invitation from Mrs. Provost to make her hermitage, as it was called the seat of his stay while Paramus, we only dined with Mrs. Watkins and her two charming daughters who sang us several pretty songs in a very agreeable manner. At Mrs. Provost, we found some fair refugees from New York who were on a visit to the Lady of the Hermitage. With them, we talked and walked and laughed and danced and gallanted away the leisure hours of four days and four nights and would have gallanted and danced and laughed and talked and walked with them till now had not the general given orders for our departure. We left them, however, in the spirit of modern soldiership without much sighing in pursuit of the dangers of war and pleasures of variety. I mean, that sort of says it all. Now, what, where am I coming from? Well, I mean, what does all this mean? Well, my theory is that Mary Hannah and the connection with the families between the Bruer family and the Price Hunt families led me to believe that if a woman was able to take information to Washington about the defenses of British occupied Allentown to him at the time that he needed to make a battle decision regarding the British retreating across New Jersey and how he would interact with them. That would be very valuable information. It's the only thing after years of studying the Molly Pitcher legend. I've been doing this for over 20 years. In fact, it encouraged me to go to graduate school so that I can possibly look at this legend, whatever you want to call it, in a different light. And that gave me the confidence to look back at the story, which we had put aside after studying the Revolutionary War in Allentown. And it led me to believe that there's possibly that she was a, a spy carrying intelligence as part of an entourage between the two families and was able to cross lines and provide that information 
to Washington. And what gave me the confidence to have to make this statement is the subsequent information I learned about the Stillwell family and the relationship with them and Mrs. Watkins. Now, I'm back to the expense account because you could ask, well, that's just Harrison who just gave a dollar to the servant. And then left it on his expense account. Remember, there wasn't a date there, but I was able to find a true general ledger accounting of the expenses that were paid. And Mrs. Provost received, again, four pounds, 10 shillings for that visit. Now her servants were, were being paid, but Mrs. Provost was being paid. Back here, it said to a servant at Mrs. Watkins. It didn't say they weren't paying Mrs. Watkins, which would have been the traditional way to handle the transaction. It just didn't seem right to me. I'm sure you recognize that individual, Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr was among the visitors at the Hermitage, who because of his brilliancy was much of, a much welcome guest. Upon her, upon Theodosius' hus, uh, husband's death in either 1779 or 1781, depending upon what you want to think about Theodosia, Colonel Burr eventually marries her, even though she was 10 years his senior, on July 2nd, 1782. Their love affair was notorious. In fact, here's an engraving of Aaron Burr on a midnight visit to Mrs. Provost. He at the time was in command of troops in Westchester County, and it was said that he would ride across, <laughs> he would row across the, well, he would row, <laughs> his soldiers would row across the Hudson and go to visit her, and he would make it back for revelry in time the following day. Now, around the same time that Theodosius is hosting General Washington, General Sterling is writing to Aaron Burr, and he asks that he continue to gain intelligence from the city, and specifically asks that he send over one, two, or three trusty persons to the city to get the reports, the newspapers, and the truth that they can. I know this is from New Brunswick because he mentions that they're going to exhibit a grand coup de joie, which we know Washington's troops celebrated after the Battle of Monmouth. They're celebrating the Declaration of Independence. So about a month later, Aaron Burr is in charge of a flag boat and down here added is a notation that he's bringing Mrs. Provost and her half sister, Miss DeVisme, along with one manservant in consequence of Earl Sterling's leave to pass to New York and return. It said they were set, they stayed around four or five days. And it's rare you get um, such a connection in historical documentation as this. Um, I believe Burr was, I want to say, using Mrs. Provost or maybe they thought it would be a very good idea to visit their relatives. It could be innocent, but at the same time, they could be gathering the intelligence that Lord, Lord, Lord Sterling had commanded Burr to obtain. Now, I don't know if you recognize Peggy Shippen Arnold. But there's an interesting account about her and Theodosia at the Hermitage. 
that I need to mention. Believing that Theodosia, and this is right around the time she's marrying Burr, I believe it was subsequent to that. But it said that, and this is from Burr's memoir, the frantic scenes of West Point were renewed. This is after Arnold had been exposed, uh, giving the plans of West Point's defenses away to Major Andre. Andre was discovered. He was subsequently hanged. Um, and this is what Peggy Shippen, according to Burr, said about, or Burr was saying, what occurred. It said that the frantic scenes of West Point were renewed and continued so long as strangers were present. Mrs. Provost was known as the wife of a British officer and connected with the Royalists. In her, therefore, Mrs. Arnold could confide. As soon as they were left alone, Mrs. Arnold became tranquilized after being hysterical since becoming aware of Arnold's treason. But she assured Mrs. Provost that she was heartily sick of the theatrics she was exhibiting. She stated that she had corresponded with the British commander, that she was disgusted with the American cause and those who had the management of public affairs, and that through great persuasion and unceasing perseverance, she had ultimately brought the general into an arrangement to surrender West Point to the British. It said she must have quite worn out unsuspecting Major Franks before he delivered her safe to her family in Philadelphia. Quite an account. I suspect Theodosia was a double agent. Now, as strange as this tale has been up till this point, it's going to become even stranger with the next slide. Because I have been doing this Molly Pitcher program for a long time. And I was even giving it to a women's group at the Hamilton Square Presbyterian Church. And a woman took me aside, and this was before the Watkins and the Stillwell sisters and all other that I've since told you about. And she said that, oh, I grew up in the area. Oh, no, it must have been just about the time I was suspecting. And she said, I grew up in the area. She goes, there was a tradition that when they restored, it's now a state historic site, when they restored the hermitage, that they found a dead body. And the body was wrapped in an American flag. And I says, oh, that's got to be nonsense. But I'll take down your information. I've since kept in touch with this woman. And then lo and behold, I find this account, excuse me, this account, Alan J. Clark, in a book I do not recommend at all, makes absolutely no sense, where he tries to claim that Aaron Burr and Theodosia were actually uh, British spies and that they worked to return the wealth of Manhattan by way of Trinity Church and the, and the 99 year leases, et cetera, et cetera, to the British royalty. And Aaron Burr and Theodosia were all complicit. Regardless, the name of the book is Cipher Code of Dishonor, Aaron Burr, an American Enigma. Here it said that the body of Albert Zabriskie was found at the Hermitage after the war by the Rosencrantz family. Counting windows on the top floor, an extra set was not accounted for from within the house. They go on to say a secret room was found, possibly Zabriskie. Body was found clothed as a Hessian captain and draped in an American battle flag. And he goes on to claim that the secret room proves the supposition that Theodosia Prevost was involved in espionage and her home was a haven for spies, Tories, and refugees. Uh, I, I don't make this stuff up, as they say. I just record it and tell the story to you. Now, I have a little more and I reserve a right to come back, but at this time, I believe it's a good time to stop and take questions. Thank you. Okay.
Okay, so we'll open it up. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, if that's the case, then I'm going to attempt to start the program again. If you know, John, we have somebody who's asking who lived at the Hermitage. Um, okay, so hold on. From Marjorie, was it routine to pay a dollar for something? Um. No, actually, at this time, the, the Continental hadn't depreciated as much as, as it would eventually. Um, the dollar was, was approximately um, worth about a half a pound or less, between a third and, and, and a half a pound. So um, he's, it appears as if on the expense accounts, the only people that he's paying dollars to, though, are the Patriots. Anybody that be considered a loyalist was definitely not accepting the continental dollar and they were um, being paid in hard currency. <clears throat> I have somebody asking if the actress Molly Anderson was a model for any of the Molly images. Do you know that? No. Uh, was she 19th century? Is this the, uh, you mean the relief? Yeah, I guess so. I don't know. Okay. Um, let me go on just a little bit further uh, because I expected someone to ask, well, what happened to the story of the canon and Molly and where did that tradition come from? Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, am I still sharing the screen, Dana? You are. Okay, yeah, I can't get up there to make it a full screen, but uh, essentially what I have here is an account of two sisters and they, not surprisingly, their family name is Stillwell. <laughs> They're from uh, the Cape May area. I believe it's another branch of Nicholas Stillwell, not Richard, but um, it was said that Rebecca, who was left alone at the naval base, the, um, there was an important privateering naval base down at Beasley Point at Cape May, where the, where the bridge is today, uh, we cross into the county. And that a British uh, landing party was attempting to attack the base. And there was one gun that was primed and that she, seeing them attempting to land with the help of her children, fired the cannon. And it was so effective, it was said that it, they warded off the British landing party. <laughs> now, this has been a long tradition. In fact, one of my graduate school teachers had written the history about this, and he surmised that maybe um, it was based on Molly Pitcher. And, but I turn it the other way around because I believe that this tradition about a woman firing a cannon prior to the Battle of Bomb would have been in people's minds also. So as us historians say, the information could have become conflated and the image of a cannon. And what else helps me bolster that idea is that her sister, Rebecca, was also a Revolutionary War note because her husband was a privateer captain by the name of Moses Griffin. And I know he was in Allentown around that time because he was here at the Port of Admiralty. I have an account of Captain Moses Griffin making a claim. So if he was spreading that story at the same time, uh, after this time, it's said that he was captured. Actually, he was he was captured, but he was captured by um, by the Americans because he had somehow taken command of a British boat. It's a long story, but uh, the tradition holds that she then went up to Washington's headquarters. This is his wife, 
Tara, the sister, and got permission, uh, if not an officer, to exchange, and she was able to save her husband's life or at least get him released from captivity. And it would have been easy for Washington because he wouldn't have needed anything to trade for because the gentleman was in the hands of the Patriots or the Continental Army. And here is their home today. I mean, um, Rebecca and James Willett's, Captain James Willett who was the militia captain. Uh, and this was the location of where the cannon was fired. Okay, now I'm done, promise. Okay, so good. So have you traced this woman after the revolution? Which woman is that? Hannah had a woman? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I haven't been, although although her husband, Kavanaugh, uh, even though he, um, interestingly enough, encouraged us originally because we found him on a casualty list, but he then shows up later in the war. Um, at the time, we thought that was better proof, and I know when... Um, David Martin did his source book back in 2003, uh, which I helped him with, and, and we, we did include the Mary Hanna woman in that, in all those accounts about Molly Pitcher. And, um, but that's about it. <laughs>